Okay, I'm going to talk about, while uh, all these things are happening here, I'm going to talk about galaxy clusters um, because I find them fascinating <laughs> and um, because there is so much stuff accessible. And once we, once we get going, I will, I will be more formal about it. Um, but I, I think we live in a golden age of amateur astronomy in that when I joined the Cape Centre and ASA in the dark decades, years and years and years ago, what we had was we could have telescopes, we could observe objects, and we could go to a meeting, and if we were lucky, we would get a professional to talk to us, and we could read Sky and Telescope. In the last 15 years, things have changed dramatically, and we have access as amateurs to a whole expanded area of activity, and that's kind of the underlying theme of what I want to talk about. But we are going to talk about the, the whole universe in 20 minutes, or, or what is it, 30 minutes, that I have. So the first question is, why am I talking about galaxy clusters? Um, they are very faint objects, faint because they are far away, and um, yeah, so what's this got to do with, with amateur astronomy? In, in a sense, initially, um, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but they are the biggest objects we know in the universe. And that I find fascinating. So you know, it's, it's, it's got to be something you know, exciting and big stuff. Um, so that's my personal interest. But um, we live in an age also of golden age of observational and physical cosmology. In the past, cosmologists had theories and astronomers observed things and did physics and somehow they didn't really meet. But in the last, I would say, 20, 30, 50 years, um, the, they have met and we have an amazing understanding of our universe. And because galaxy clusters are such big objects in the universe, they can tell us an awful lot about how the universe came to be, how it is the way it is. But on that theme of an amateur involvement, this is what I want to talk about briefly. Um, we have this, what I would almost call virtual armchair observing where a, an amateur can go to the internet, the World Wide Web, and use that as his telescope. Um, we have unparalleled access to astronomical information, and it's all free, and that is amazing to me. We can go to databases, I've mentioned some of them, we can look at images, astronomy picture of the day is a very simple one, uh, we can look at spectra of objects that have been taken by Hubble or by other survey telescopes, etc. We can look up properties of objects, catalogs, and so on. There's a whole lot of free programming stuff on the internet. Python is the one that I really like, a programming language. It has a lot of astronomical, statistical, scientific components that you can incorporate in your programs if you do write programs. There are free software applications. Uh, we heard about some of them yesterday during the image processing workshop, for instance. <coughs> There are hosts of explanations on the internet that you can read, a wiki, and then you type in other stuff and you read explanations by real experts. It's all there, free, you know, without charge. You can access hot, right off the press science papers. Um, we can go and look at online lectures, offline lectures. I mean, you can download lectures that, that have been given at various schools, cosmology workshops, etc. It is quite amazing to me. And for instance, we have now the ability to attend, again free of charge, courses by leading experts. Um, I'm registered myself, there's a, there's a bunch of universities called Course, Course Era, uh, top universities in the world. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, and I'm going to attend a course given by Mr. Professor Jorgovsky. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce his name. He's, he's a, a great man in, in, in uh, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> um, cosmology and also in virtual observatories at Caltech. I mean, you know, what chance did I ever have of going to Caltech? And, and in January, I'm going to sit in my house and I'm going to attend lectures free of charge, you know, by top chap at Caltech. So that, that's kind of the background. So let's see what, I, what I'm interested in, what I found out about galaxy clusters. Okay, there's a galaxy cluster, um, that's, the, that's the Perseus cluster. So what are they and what can they tell us? Um, 
Right, we start off with a first sky survey that was done, in a sense, the Palomar Sky Survey. It was a photographic survey taken at two wavelengths in the 50s. Um, each plate is six by six. Uh, yes, I saw them. They used to have them at Sutherland. I don't know if they're still there in drawers. You would take them out and you could look at the, at the fields of view for whatever work you might be interested in. And it covered, it was about a thousand plates covering a large part of the sky down to deck minus 34. So in the middle 50s, a PhD student called George Bell picked up his magnifying glass and he started looking at the plates. And he counted clusters of galaxies. This is the, um, the most famous of the uh, galaxy clusters. Uh, it's the Virgo cluster. Um, I looked up Burnham's Celestial Handbook, which was probably the best reference handbook for amateurs in, in the 20th century. And basically, uh, he comments on this cluster uh, that you can possibly see with a good amateur telescope back in the 70s or 80s um, about 100 galaxies. There are actually about 3,000 in here. And this, is, this is a field of view of uh, six degrees. Um, and it was inadvertently discovered by the great comet hunter Messier, who was so irritated because all these little fuzzy blobs were there. There are 16 Messier objects in this small field of view, and they're all galaxies. But he noted them because they uh, irritated him when he was looking for comets. That's, that was his reasoning. So um, our friend Abel sat with a magnifying glass, and he counted clusters. He had a, a set of rules, I won't dwell on them, but he uh, had a criteria. He had to have uh, 50 or more galaxies in a certain radius. Um, there was a, a, a qualification about the brightness of, of the clusters, and he did spectroscopy on a particular tenth brightest. That was his. These were all rules that he dreamt up for measuring clusters. It was the, the first cluster survey. You obviously want to know how far away it is. So, so he used one of the galaxies in the cluster to determine the dif distance using redshift. And he published his paper in uh, 1957, and he basically said that there's an awful lot of these things, and um, there is a highly significant non-random surface distribution of clusters and so on, um, and he looked at the distribution as well. I won't say more about what George did, because we'll come back to distribution of clusters. But ultimately, uh, the catalogue was updated a bit and, and revised, and it was the first catalogue of 4,000 galaxy clusters. So, what are they? Well, they are faint because they tend to be far away. So the average amateur, apart from looking at, uh, at Virgo and possibly the, the cluster in Coma, uh, which has only two kind of accessible galaxies in it for, for, uh, for the amateur, uh, the rest are pretty faint and, and not often photographed. Um, they are the largest physical objects, and I'll come to how we know that they are physical objects as opposed to just random galaxies kind of just scattered all over the place that they are somehow working together. Um, the Milky Way has a, a mass of about 10 to the 11 solar masses. In other words, 10 to the 11 suns in the Milky Way. Milky Way, one galaxy. Okay, it has a diameter of about 35 kiloparsecs. Uh, parsec is uh, about three and a bit light years. I sometimes will say parsec, sometimes I will say light year. And galaxy clusters typically contain in the order of a couple of hundred, if not a thousand or more clusters, oh, sorry, galaxies themselves. And the total mass of such a thing then is up to 10 to the 16 solar masses. Now the first hint we have that they are a physical entity is that if you measure the velocities of the galaxies in the cluster, they have a spread uh, of velocities. And that then can be looked at to see that the galaxies in the cluster are in some form of orbit. Okay? In other words, they are somehow gravitationally attracted to each other. Um, most of them are elliptical and spiral. 
which implies that the galaxy clusters are quite old. They've been around for a while. Okay, the irregular parts, uh, irregular clusters tend to be much younger, sorry, irregular galaxies. And often they have a very bright galaxy right in the middle. It's called the brightest ga cluster galaxy, BGC, BCG, sorry. Um, okay, we've defined it. Um, BGC galaxies tend to be the most massive single galaxies in the universe. So in the middle of a galaxy cluster, you find a very massive galaxy. Um, they are generally elliptical galaxies, and they tend to lie, as I've already said, in the middle of the cluster, not only geometrically, but also in a sense of other galaxies in some way orbiting around them. <coughs> and they are also coincident with the peak of the cluster X-ray emission and the centre of radio lobes. So, um, I'm not sure why I'm showing you this again, uh, but to say there's lots of stuff here. And now we're going to look at some of the galaxies, some of the other clusters. So here's a cluster uh, number 85, and this is the optical image. And in the kind of... Um, the last half of the, of the previous century, we started using radio astronomy, and when we had satellites, we could observe X-ray in the X-ray region. So, if you look at that exactly same field of view, you'll see there's a cl bright cluster in the middle, and this is the X-ray version. So there is the bright cluster again in the middle, and X-ray means seriously hot, millions of degrees. So a galaxy cluster is surrounded, or it consists also not only of the galaxies inside it, but of very, very hot gas, which also then tells us this is some kind of a physical entity. It's not just a random scattering of stuff. And um, same picture for another uh, galaxy, sorry, cluster, um, again, this is from DSS, is Deep Sky Survey. Uh, that, that's the cluster. And you can see it's far away. This one is, is quite far out, shall we say, from us. So the, the quality of the image is not good. But here is the Chandra picture of the same field of view. And now we get to uh, <coughs> X-rays. Uh, sorry, X-ray <coughs> radio waves that, that we've heard so much about in the previous two lectures. And this is another galaxy cluster. There is the optical Hubble. There's the X-ray of Chandra. And here is the very large array of radio. And you put the whole lot together. There is the cluster. There is the bright central object, the big bright galaxy. And here we have the radio lobes. And that tells us, basically, that this is a system. The things are falling in, and they are falling into a black hole which is in the middle of the bright central galaxy, which is there. And because of accretion mechanics, you are getting stuff shooting out, the relativistic jets. And so this is a whole system. So now we know what galaxy clusters are. And as you can see, they are quite rich. This is another one. And there's something I want you to note for later, is these little arcs you see here. Little arcs. OK. But how do these clusters actually operate? And the theory is that they are caused by galaxies attracting each other gravitationally and all falling in slowly. So it's like this huge uh, magnet, shall we say, a gravitational magnet. Uh, and they fall in and they attract each other, they rotate. And we get things like galaxy collisions in in the cluster because now they are closer than they would normally be and slowly the, the cluster grows in terms of mass. So that's the kind of theory. Right, so now we want to know more about clusters. And clusters are not something you can just go outside and sort of say, oh there's a cluster. You need to do deep sky surveys, you need to look far back, in other words very faint, and it gives you some idea of what is going on in the universe. Now, this is one of the famous uh, surveys. This is the, uh, 
the Sloan Dark Sky Survey. It's a 2.5 automated telescope, optical telescope, uh, and it scans the sky. And basically, it has uh, an optical CCD, that one, and it's got the same again, each one with a different filter on, so you can do photometry on the objects you observe. And this has done a number of surveys for a number of years, and it can also, they can take this off the telescope and instead put in a spectrographic fiber plate. In other words, they drill holes in a plate uh, where the objects are that they know already that they want to take a spectra of, so they can measure the redshift and thus the distance. And they plug that, those optical fibers into those holes and it all goes to a spectrograph which measures the spectrum and hence the redshift. And data release 9, which is the ninth kind of <coughs> release of data that they've done, uh, covered uh, so many square degrees. I'm not going to read that all out to you. Uh, but what is interesting to us is, apart from the, all the objects, uh, that they have already taken a spectra of one and a half million galaxies. Not galaxy clusters, galaxies. Okay? And that data, you can go home and download that today. It's all available, free of charge. I have downloaded some, not of this release, but of a previous release, of Redshifts and RA and DEC for a million galaxies, okay? And that tells you the redshift, the RA and the deck gives you a 3D distribution of the galaxies. So and you can do nice and interesting computations on that. So what, now we know what they are, now we have kind of had a survey, and now how does this all fit in with what we know about the universe? Well, we have this cosmic microwave background, which is a kind of a relic of inflation, the Big Bang, etc. Don't have time to go into it. But basically, uh, it's, it's an all-sky picture. Uh, if you had a certain kind of a microwave detector and you scanned the sky, and you would find that the sky was slightly hotter and slightly colder in certain places. But the temperature differences shown in this, in this chart are minute. So we can actually assume that the universe at some stage a long time ago was flat. When I say flat, I mean it was completely smooth. So how did we get from this smoothness to this kind of structure? This structure is from the Sloan survey and the galaxies are plotted. Galaxies, not clusters, galaxies are plotted, redshift and RA and deck. And you can see voids, you can see places where there are concentrations of galaxies, and that is where the galaxy clusters occur. And then you see bigger things which are called superclusters and, and so on. Um, so how did we get there from there to here? Well, um, it's thought, and that is the model which I'm sure you've seen before, um, that at some po point here we have the, uh, a whole lot of stuff happening, and I'll talk about that very briefly. And there is a thing called uh, decoupling. And then eventually all this matter kind of starts expanding, all right? And, but there is some little bit of instability. In other words, it's very smooth, but there's a little bit of instability. And you get slight over densities of matter. And gravity then, in those places, attracts. So the places that, are, that have get richer, shall we say, and the ones who don't have get poorer. So you get this, eventually the smoothness starts breaking up, you get stars forming, and then you get galaxies, and then you get galaxy clusters. And we also notice, for instance, that over here we have an acceleration, the famous dark energy, uh, which the Nobel Prize was awarded for last year. So let's see how galaxies can help us with that. But before we do that, how do we actually find clusters? Because we, you know, we can't just go around pointing telescopes at the sky hoping to find a cluster. And if you, say, look for X-ray emissions, there are lots of other things that emit X-rays. And there are lots of other things that do radio. So the challenge is to actually use algorithms to count galaxies and to see if they occur in a certain 3D piece of the universe. And that's quite exciting, 
Um, you basically say, take a galaxy, and you say, is there anyone nearby? Okay, in the 3D sense. And then you say, oh, okay, well, this one's nearby. Is there anyone nearby that one? And you, if you build up a, a, a kind of a pattern by scanning every single galaxy, and you find where there are clusters of galaxies. Show what you say, yes. And that is one way of, of looking for galaxy clusters. It's, it's very computationally intensive. It requires uh, various different algorithms and so on. And, and I'm very happy to say that, that Bruce Bassett, I'm not sure if he's here, but he's talking to us tomorrow, encouraged me to look into these matters. And I found them absolutely fascinating. Right, so what can galaxy clusters tell us um, about the universe and how it's expanding and so on? Um, they can help us. There are four techniques for looking at uh, cosmic acceleration and or, that's the dark energy component, and the, the distribution of matter in the universe. Um, the type 1a supernova, we know about those. Those are the standard candles, and those observations led to the fact that the universe is expanding more. It's accelerating in expansion, the famous dark energy. But that's got nothing to do with galaxy clusters as such. The other techniques are weak gravitational lensing, baryon acoustic oscillations, and abundance of galaxy clusters. There is a, another technique which is called the integrated sachs wolf effect. I won't go into that, but I'll just mention it for completeness, uh, which, which also is effective, is a galaxy cluster thing. And unfortunately, you can't see it, but anybody who wants to read a very nice up-to-date review, there's one by Weinberg published this year. Weinberg et al., uh, which, which covers these things. Gravitational lensing. Basically, Einstein showed that matter bends light. Okay, I'm just, that's, that's enough. Eddington demonstrated that it was so in the famous Eclipse Expedition of 1919. But what we have here is a galaxy, just to illustrate, and somewhere Miles further back, light years, megaparsecs, is another galaxy. The other galaxy is blue. And what happens is that the light, it's just coincident in this case, that the light from the galaxy that's far behind the screen, shall we say, is bent like a lens, like a lens in a, in a binocular telescope or the old refractor, is bent round by the gravitational field of this galaxy. And that is called weak lensing. And it's amazing technique because what you can do is you can take the spectrum of a galaxy that you wouldn't normally see because it would be very faint, but it's magnified by the front galaxy. You can take a spectrum and determine, for instance, how far away the back galaxy is from the redshift. Um, you can also, by knowing the, or assuming properties of the back galaxy, the blue one, you can make measurements of the mass of the front galaxy. So that, that, is, that is a weak lensing, in this case just by one galaxy. But here are a number of cases that were discussed at a workshop. Um, and we'll come back to dark energy survey. Um, and there are some examples of, of lensing effects. Some done by individual stars and some done in ga by uh, galaxy clusters. So a galaxy cluster effectively uh, can, by lensing, and you can see the, some of the strange lensing effects here, there's a tendency for the whole thing to be distorted in a circular way, the lens. Uh, so the foreground galaxy cluster gives you information about what's further back in the universe, further back in time, and also gives you information about the galaxy cluster. So weak lensing is, is a, a great detecting tool. Um, sorry, that's the name of that particular cluster. Um, and I, I showed you the, a picture of Abel. Thank you. <laughs> and Abel is, um, also had those arcs. And that was also a lensing cluster. Then we have something called baryon acoustic oscillations. Um, before the CMB was formed, Right in the beginning of the universe, everything expanded. It was very dense, and there was a huge competition between photons and matter, especially baryonic matter. 
and the matter tried to collapse and the photons pushed it out. So you kept getting explosions. And it was a bit like throwing stones into, shall we say, a swimming pool. Just one at a time and you've got explosions. They are called acoustic, meaning shock waves, uh, oscillations. And effectively, you would, if you throw a whole handful of stones into the swimming pool, you would get this kind of effect. Um, very similar in conceptually to what Jasper showed us of the overlapping circles in the radio telescope business. And the whole idea is that at a point, the photon suddenly, the things got cool enough, the photons decoupled from the matter, and the idea is that that pattern should then be imprinted um, on the universe. Those are those disturbances I spoke to about where there are certain things that are dense and certain things are not dense. It is this disturbance that's imprinted and that decoupling, when it occurred, most of those circles that overlap each other would be about 150 megaparsecs across. So, what do you do? You basically take your Sloan Digital Survey and you do a correlation function. In other words, you count and you look for the probability what is the probability that on average there will be more galaxies at a certain distance than others? And to cut a long story short, that's the theory. And if you count the sort of galaxies and you look at a, a distance, you should, if that 150 megaparsecs theory from that uh, photon stuff in the baryon acoustics oscillation right at the beginning of the universe is true, then you should get a dent a bump in the curve at about 150 <coughs> megaparsecs. A paper which looked at two quarter of a million gas galaxies this year, which was published this year, um, from again from the um, Sloan Dark Survey, and they're doing now a survey called BOSS, which is Baryon uh, Oscillation Survey, and here's from their paper. Don't worry about the, the axis. There's a reason why it's not at 150. Uh, but believe me, there is the dent, or the bump, sorry. So the theory and the practice meets, the, the observation meets, which implies that those baryon acoustic oscillations really were so. Um, I'm going to have to start cutting down. But the next thing is, this is a simulation from the Millennium Simulation of how the universe started off after the decoupling. You see first it's smooth and then slowly the, the matter falls and forms galaxy clusters and filaments and so on. And the idea is that there are various techniques to measure uh, the distribution of these galaxies and or their mass. Um, if dark energy really occurs, it stops at the point, it stops this uh, collapse occurring. You see, no dark energy, there's a, there's a collapse into filaments and so on. If there was lots of dark energy, it would prevent that. And you can then do statistical work to see how much dark energy there is. And this has been done by weighing clusters, by measuring the temp X-ray temperature, and d using various complicated bits of, of the or a theoretical part, and you actually show that the dark energy component is the same by using galaxy cluster mass distributions as it is by supernova type 1a. Um, I'm going to jump over that. that those, are, those are the curves showing the, theory, the, the, the curves are the theoretical curves of distribution, and the blue are the actual observations at two different distances. And this just to show you, if you change the parameters in the Lambda CDM model, uh, then it doesn't work. So that, that's one. Um, then the other way of looking at this, and I'm going to stop right now almost, is basically to take that Sloan survey and to do a simulation. And the latest simulation is done on a Bolshoi. It's called the Bolshoi simulation. It's done on a supercomputer in California of 14,000 CPUs all stuck together and um, it ran for uh, 5 million CPU hours and that's one of the outputs. 
that the, this is what the universe would look like and this is what it really looks like. So we have great confidence that the universe does look the way it does and it does cluster into galaxy clusters and that galaxy clusters actually do tell us lots of stuff. So I'm just going to jump to, oh, it is my last slide, there is a number of surveys coming because all these surveys we've had only look at small parts of the sky, only look at short depths into, back into the universe. The next one coming is called the Dark Energy Survey and basically uh, it was, this picture was on the front cover of NASA, the latest issue. It's a umpteen megapixel camera which uh, 570 megapixels stuck on an existing four meter telescope in Chile and we're going to learn a lot more about galaxy clusters. And this is the full max cluster in the raw, shall we say, image taken of first light of this uh, telescope. Thank you very much. I'm happy to talk later as well. Sorry, we had one. Yeah, the one thing that wasn't clear to me was um, do, are you saying that the baryon acoustic oscillation, that radius, then gives you um, the radius of the clusters, or does that just give you the. No, it gives you a distribution of the cluster. It gives you some idea of how galaxies and clusters would be distributed currently in the universe. It's, it's kind of like if you if you had a balloon and you made some coatly pen marks on it and then you blew it up hugely, the, the kind of distribution of the coatly pen marks would be much the same as they were, only much bigger in all of them. And so that so you're looking for a kind of a how far are the clusters apart and the galaxies apart. In, in based on that initial disturbance of the very, very early universe. And, and you say you see that also from your correlation? Function? You, you can't see it optically, you see it statistically in the correlation function, yes. Thank you very much, Thank you. Let's go and have some tea.